This begins a series of videos where I just read a paper and teach myself. So let's see what happens. I'm starting with this really important recent paper of Thomas Nicolaus and Peter Schulze on topological cyclic homology, which understandably is on topological cyclic homology. Um, this is a paper that I've been wanting to read for quite some time because my own research uh, is tangentially, or maybe not even tangentially, but, but related to topological cyclic homology and algebraic K-theory. And this is a really important paper that later is used in some computations and also in this broad ranging theory of um, Barkov Bot, uh, Lurie, Nikolaus, Schultz, uh, Dustin Clausen, and I'm probably forgetting a whole bunch of people, um, of doing, of using homotopy theory in number theory, arithmetic geometry, and some stuff that I'm really hoping to understand eventually. Right now I don't really understand, and maybe surprisingly this is the paper that is most accessible given my current knowledge. So I'm going to start just going through this paper. It's probably going to take quite a long time. It's a long paper. It's um, a little over 160 pages. Um, and I have a, a separate note to take notes in, um, although I might be just marking up the paper itself. I also have Wikipedia at the ready if I need to look things up. So let's just begin. Um, I already sort of read through the introduction, so let me just try to try to summarize um, summarize what's going on here and why this is interesting. So the 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 theory of topological cyclic homology um, This is sort of against the um, chronology. The, the chronology of it um, is really important in computations in algebraic K theory. So at its most basic, um, T C is a functor from some category of rings, uh, say associative unital to category of spectra, um, as is algebraic K-theory. So both, both K-theory and TC are functors from rings to spectra. And there is, in fact, a natural transformation from K to TC. This is called the cyclotomic trace. It's called a trace because it comes from a map um, that goes from, from K-theory to an easier to define invariant called topological Hochschild homology. I think I'm gonna use yellow to write like tiny little notes. So this is topological Hochschild homology. I might have put an extra C in there. It's a difficult uh, thing to... Uh, okay, what's going on here? Why can't I zoom? Come on. Oh, great. My iPad's frozen. So let's go back and reopen this. And hopefully we can move around. Great. All right. So. Earlier, there is a natural transformation from K-theory to THH called the Dennis trace. And since this is a natural transformation of functors to the category of spectra, this is a, a fairly complicated thing. There's a lot of coherences there. Um, but on pi zero, this can naively be thought of as actually taking the trace of a certain matrix. So, so that's where the name trace comes from. Um, the cyclotomic trace is a refinement 
of the Dennis trace, that is, it's a factorization of the Dennis trace through a specific map from TC to THH. And the cyclotomic trace has this really important property that if I have rings A and B with a map that's surjective such that uh, this F, such that the kernel of F is nilpotent, um, then, so by functoriality of the cyclotomic trace. Well, first, by functoriality of K-theory, um, I have a map from K of A to K of B. Functoriality of TC, I have a map from TC of A to TC of B. And the fact that the cyclotomic trace is a natural transformation gives me this commutative square and it turns out that this square is a pullback square in spectra. What this means is that the relative version of K-theory and the relative version of TC are isomorphic for nilpotent extensions of rings. More generally, we can replace the category rings here with the category of E1 ring spectra and in this case the Dennis the the, the cyclotomic trace is uh, induces this pullback square whenever A and B are connective ring spectra. Um, that is, well, I, I think I think this maybe works in the bounded below case, but at the very least, if um, the homotopy groups of these ring spectra vanish in degrees, in negative degrees. Um, so what, what Nicholas and Schultze go over in their introduction is a little bit of the history, um, and they talk about the first kind of point set definition of TC, um, and I think that's important to go over. Um, because we'll we'll see that later in the paper. Um, so. First of all, let's look at topological Hochschild homology, and, let, and let's just be in the classical ring case. So let's have A be an associative ring. Well, unital as well. We're always going to assume unital. Um, then we can form the um, simplicial object where in degree zero we have a and a tensor a over z equipped with these two maps that way and a tensor a tensor a and so forth. We have four tensors, and so on. Great. So then we have three maps here, four maps, etc. Of course, we have maps in the other direction as well. So this is the simplicial object. Um, it's a simplicial object in rings, um, but in particular we can consider it as a simplicial object in ring spectra. Um, we can take 
the geometric realization or in other words the co-limit of the functor delta op to um, E1 algebras in spectra and that gives us something called um, let me just write the simplicial object as a tensor bullet um, and this gives us something called the Hochschild homology of A. Um, the reason it's not called the topological Hochschild homology of A is because we're working over Z instead of eventually we'll be working over the sphere spectrum. Okay, well, so one of the things that you might notice um, each of the entries of this complex, uh, of this simplicial object, each entry, um, you know, A tensor I as an action of the cyclic group Z mod I. And And the totality of these actions are compatible with the structure maps of the simplicial object. As a result, there's an action of the circle group Going to write boldface T on the Hochschild homology of A. And we have two um, theories that we get from this. So this is an action in the infinity category of, um, of E1 ring spectra. So we can take a couple different limits and co-limits. The first is if we take the homotopy fixed points, uh, first is the homotopy orbits um, of this action. So that's HH sub HT. Um, this means homotopy orbits. Um, and then this is what we call cyclic homology. And dually, or no, let me not use that word because I'm not entirely sure what's the correct thing to say. Um, well, if we take homotopy fixed points, so that's upper HT, we get something called negative cyclic homology. This is homotopy fixed points. There are a number of point set constructions of homotopy fixed points that I'm just not gonna, gonna go over right now. We uh, Maybe we'll need them later in the paper. I haven't read that far. Um, so let's, let's just continue looking through this introduction. Um, Ultimately, right, so what we can do is um, now working, so we're now working over an E1 ring spectrum. Um, this just makes some things easier to phrase. We can look at the simplicial, the simplicial object, um, this, this complex of, of tensor powers of A, but now taken over the sphere spectrum, the initial E1 ring spectrum. Um, we're sort of base changing back to 
like the primordial thing as opposed to whereas in in ordinary rings z is exactly what what we're looking for there but but here we're looking for this sphere spectrum um so this again gives us a simplicial object where we can take the geometric realization and that has an action of the circle group and we can talk about its homotopy fixed points so that's the thing here is called tc minus um i think it's important for me to point out a bit of history in the first draft of this paper this was called thc minus but the Facebook and Twitter page derived memes for spectral schemes made a cannabis joke and Nikolaus Schulze changed the notation This is how serious we mathematicians are. It's wonderful. Um, okay. So, right. So there are some interesting things they say about TC, um, in particular things that are motivated by uh, like arithmetic geometry and um, geometry, uh, p-adic algebraic geometry. But that's stuff that I really don't understand yet. Um, so they mentioned that there's going to be some uh, point set models of spectra that we're going to be using, um, or at the very least have been used in the initial literature that defines TC. Um, and they start defining what's called a, a cyclotomic spectrum, um, first in orthogonal spectra, which is their... Um, which is the chosen model for spectra. Um, and then in infinity category, in, in the infinity categorical world. Um, so their, their first main definition is this definition 1.3. Um, this is a drastically simplified definition of what a cyclotomic spectrum is compared to the the definition that we get from um, Bookstead Shang Madsen. And this is this is essentially what like what makes this paper so so groundbreaking. Is that we have this really, really succinct definition of things. So what is this? So it's it's first of all a a genuine equivariant, um, or no, no, I don't. It, it's it's a it's a t equivariant spectrum, which could either mean genuine equivariant or. Uh, what people sometimes call homotopy or Borel or even naive equivariant. Um, genuine equivariance is a lot more complicated and has to do with compatibility with all closed subgroups, the actions of all closed subgroups. Um, homotopy equivariance is significantly less complicated and it's just a functor from the classifying space viewed as a category of the circle group to spectra. So what that ends up giving is it, it selects, it, um, this category has, has a unique object, and it selects an object and um, a, a, a group of, a, a circle group's worth of automorphisms of that object. So that's kind of what you expect from an action. Um, so there, there's an important thing that we're going to talk about, um, which is this, 
it's this thing called the Tate construction. Um, this is something that's available in in the classical in the world of ordinary rings and um, ordinary algebraic geometry and stuff, or ordinary algebra, um, and it's. So there's there's this map called the norm map that I'm not remembering how it's defined, but we'll get there. Um, I mean, it's it's a map from uh, is homotopy orbits a colimit or limit? I mean, I would hope that it's a map from a colimit to a limit, but anyway, we'll figure that out. Um, and we're working in the category of spectra, so we can take we can take the cofiber, um, so the essentially the quotient of homotopy fixed points by homotopy orbits, as sort of included by the norm map, but the norm the norm map is not necessarily uh, not an inclusion. Um, so this is their really important theorem. I mean, obviously they say it's their main theorem, and if it's the main theorem in a hundred and seventy page paper, then it's probably very important. Um, Essentially, the two definitions that they give of cyclotomic spectra, one as um, one via the point set model of orthogonal spectra, and one as definition 1.3 that they have here that I highlighted. Um, these are the same when restricted to the subcategories of bounded below spectra. So bounded below spectra are those where pi less than some i is zero for for some natural number uh, for some integer i, and then um, because they have this equivalence of categories, uh, they deduce a really simple formula for T C. Cool. All right. What else do we have here? Um, I think I think I'm gonna go on to section one, which luckily is about the Tate construction. Um, so the Tate construction is. I mean, <laughs> I don't really just want to literally read what's going on here, but yeah, anyway, so we get this, okay, so we're going to define the Tate construction, we're going to prove some, we're going to prove um, lax, nope, I don't want that color, I want this color, we're going to prove that the Tate construction is lax symmetric monoidal, um, And as we go, I'll, ex I'll explain what all those things mean, partially because I need to remind myself of what these all mean. All right. Um, I'm going to assume that everyone's familiar with the language of infinity categories. If not, uh, at some point in the next 13 years, I will release some videos about <laughs> higher category theory. Um, but I'm very behind on all of that, so... Bear with me. All right. So we're we're starting to talk about the idea of 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 um, mapping from a colimit to a limit, and and what kind of what kind of data are required there. So we start talking about pre-additive category. Um, this is something that I. You, you might also see referred to as semi-additive. Um, that you have all finite products and finite coproducts. And once you have finite products and finite coproducts and the empty product and empty coproduct agree, that is uh, 
a, the terminal and initial object agree. Then, via this matrix formula, we get a map from the binary co-product of two objects to the binary product of the same objects. And we can ask for that map to be an equivalence. Um, yeah, so sometimes semi-additive, you'll see pre-additive uh, as well here. So, yeah, so in the case that we have a pre-additive category, we write O plus to mean co-product and product. Um, sometimes you'll still see co-product or product if we're meaning to emphasize a particular universal property. Um, great. So, yeah, so this extra condition three, talking about um, additivity, uh, so this, this HOM space, uh, that, that set of HOMs will always be a monoid. Well, okay, yeah, they say it up there. Um, we get a commutative monoid structure, and so if, if there are inverses, then that category is called ad additive. Um, so this is interesting. They decide to define stable infinity categories as additive categories where all finite limits and co-limits exist and the loop functor is an equivalence. I don't think um, additivity should not be necessary there. That a stable infinity category just has all finite limits and co-limits and loops uh, sigma infinity or sorry sigma and loop or adjoint equivalences you don't uh, additivity comes for free anyway um, okay great so they do end up defining a g equivariant object the uh, um, as a as sort of a naive or Borel g equivariant object. So let's just want to write that down. But what is going on? The pen. Oh, why? Notability does not want to play nice with me right now. There we go. Okay, so a fix a group G. C an affinity category. I'm usually a little loose about when I'm talking about ordinary categories versus infinity categories. Um, I'll try to be a little bit more precise, at least early on, um, but uh, it really doesn't end up mattering. Category just means infinity category to me, and sort of all things are as infinity categorical as possible. Um, so a G equivariant object in C is a functor from the classifying space of G viewed as, well, an infinity groupoid and therefore an infinity category to C. This is a classifying space. All right, I think in this video, I'm just gonna try and get through the definition of the norm map. Um, or no, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do that yet. Let's talk about homotopy orbits. Um, homotopy orbits and fixed points, great. And then I'll in this video. It's getting long enough already.
Okay. So, G group. C in infinity category. So there's a functor called HG. This maps from the category of G equivariant object in C to C. And what is it given by? Well, it takes a functor, it takes a G equivariant object F, and just takes the colimit over the infinity category EG. BG is a category, so we can take the column in over it. That is, of course, if this exists. If G is a finite group and C is stable, then this will always exist. We'll use that a lot because um, the important groups that we'll encounter in this are um, finite cyclic groups. And duly, we can take the limit, and those are the homotopy fixed points. So I was right in saying that the norm map will be at least possible to construct because it is a map from a co-limit to a limit. All right, let's stop there.